Amen. Please be seated. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2, page 909 in the Pew Bibles. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 makes me nervous. I am a Presbyterian, after all. And we like our theology systematic. We like our means of grace ordinary. And we like our procedure parliamentary. A few, uh, in, a, in fact, a few years ago, in one of our Friday mornings here at the church, we were looking over the order of worship for the coming Sunday. It was basically the our standard liturgy for a worship service, and somebody made the comment that it all looked pretty cut and dry. And I made the comment somewhat sarcastically, yeah, just like we want our worship to be, right. And over time, that became a bit of a running joke, an inside joke about things being cut and dry, until one day, after a, a few years, somebody made the comment that, like Wiley would say, it looks pretty cut and dry. <laughs> Somehow it had been attributed to me as time went by, and I thought, no, 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 I, I'm not going to let this go. That is not what I said. Well, so maybe we don't, we don't want things cut and dry, but decent, reverent, and in good order, yes. And those are good things. And then we come to a passage like Acts chapter 2, and there's the filling with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and miracles, and revival. There's the mystery of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. There's the early church engaged in this practice of radical sharing and generosity. And that makes me nervous. How much of this passage is to be normative and prescriptive for life in the modern church? How are we to apply this passage to our lives today? Well, surely we can sort all those things out in about 30 minutes, right? Maybe not. But I do think that this passage should challenge us in some ways. And really every passage should challenge us, shouldn't it? Because if we understand what Jesus has done, if we understand the work of the Holy Spirit, then it's going to disrupt our lives and it's going to change our relationships and practices in all of our lives. So, Let's find out what God has for us from Acts chapter 2 tonight. Let me pray before we open God's word together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you that you turn our attention there tonight. Would you help us to come reverently and expectantly and that we would not quench the Spirit, but that we would walk in the Spirit, that we would worship in Spirit and in truth, that you would speak to us through your word for your servants listen. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at the sound of the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all are, were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. 
But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, every one whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. I want us to see two things from these verses. The first is that salvation is all forgiveness. Salvation is, is the forgiveness of all sins. So salvation is all forgiveness, but secondly, forgiveness is not all of salvation. So salvation is all forgiveness, and forgiveness is not all of salvation. First, salvation is all forgiveness. There's a lot going on in this passage. 
And that thing that preachers say sometimes about how you could do a whole sermon series just on this one chapter is true of Acts chapter 2. But one way that we can structure this passage or get an understanding of some of the events and what's going on here is to look at two questions. Two questions in this chapter. The first is in verse 12. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And then down in verse 37 is the second question. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What does this mean and what shall we do? The first question came because there was this group of Galileans who started speaking in a bunch of different languages. Pentecost, you see, was one of the three pilgrimage festivals that were held in Jerusalem each year. It was held seven weeks after the Passover, and it was to commemorate or to celebrate the the coming of the spring harvest, and people came to Jerusalem from all over. We see in this passage there were Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, and visitors from Rome. There were Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, and when Jesus' disciples who were staying in Jerusalem and devoting themselves to prayer as Jesus had told them to do, when they were all together in one place, there came this sound like a mighty rushing wind. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Verse 4 says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a momentous event. This is like Moses and the burning bush. This is like the Exodus and the pillar of fire. This is like Sinai and fire on the mountain. This is a theophany. This is a a manifestation of God's glory. This is a representation of God's presence among his people. We don't know what that looked like. But we're told that it was distributed to each one of them. And as it was, they began to speak. And they began to speak in the different languages of all the people that had gathered around Jerusalem at that time. What does this mean? Were they drunk? No, Peter says. They were not drunk in verse 15. And by the way, they weren't speaking gibberish either. Their speaking in tongues was the tongues of the languages that could be understood by the people that were there in the city at that time. And Peter says that the phenomenon that they were observing was the fulfillment of scriptures. The prophet Joel had proclaimed the day. He had proclaimed the last days, the the great and magnificent day of the Lord when God would pour out his spirit on all flesh and there would be signs and there would be wonders and, and people would be enabled to speak God's word with new and fresh power. In other words, the reason that they heard the disciples speaking and telling the mighty works of God in other tongues was because it was because the day of the Lord had come and the Spirit had been poured out. The coming of the day of the Lord was tied to the coming of Jesus of Nazareth. And this Jesus, Peter says, this Jesus who did many mighty works and wonders and signs This Jesus was crucified, and he died, was buried, and was raised. This Jesus ascended to be exalted at the right hand of God. This Jesus poured out this that you yourselves are now seeing and hearing, as it says in verse 33. What he's saying is that this Jesus is the one who brings in the day of the Lord. Why? How? Because he is the Lord. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel know, therefore, 
for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What do we do? How do we respond to this? What does Peter say in verse 38? Repent. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. I have a neighbor who is a, a member of the Beth Israel congregation here in Jackson. And he's, he's recently asked me to come to speak about what I believe to a group from the temple that meets in his house from time to time. And if you, you would pray for me in that, I would greatly appreciate it. But a friend, of, a friend of mine asked me, what are you going to do? What are you going to say when there will surely be difficult questions that are posed to you? Difficult questions about salvation and about the hope of Israel. And one thing I want to say is that one of the major reasons that I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, it's because of all the ways that Jesus fulfills what was written about him hundreds thousands of years beforehand in the Hebrew scriptures. You see, the law and the prophets and the writings, they said the things that would happen long before they took place. And that, in essence, is what Peter is saying in Acts chapter 2, that Jesus is the fulfillment. He fulfills what was written about him beforehand in those Hebrew scriptures are the way to interpret the events that were taking place and unfolding in those days in Jerusalem. The Hebrew scriptures are the way to understand what the meaning of the cross is and the resurrection and the ascension and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Those things demonstrate that Jesus is the Lord, that Jesus is the Christ. And what does it mean to recognize that? What does it mean to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Christ? What does it mean to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? It means to be saved. It means the forgiveness of your sins. And verse 21 says, Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus as Lord has their sins wiped out, forgiven. Everyone, regardless of where they come from, regardless of how devout or how depraved they are, even regardless of whether they crucified Jesus themselves. Everyone. Period. That's the good news for us tonight. And what we have here in Acts chapter 2 are these two streams of testimony that are coming together as one. And there's the witness on the one hand of the Old Testament scriptures coming together with the eyewitness accounts of the apostles. And in a sense, Peter is saying that the scriptures explain what they were seeing. And in some ways, the scriptures are a fact check for what had happened with Jesus that were written long ago. It's a fact check in the reverse order. And the apostles, they're saying, how could Jesus not be the Christ? How could Jesus not be the Lord in view of all these things that were written about him beforehand? And because they had seen it and they were so convinced of who he was, they went and they took that message around the world. They would almost to a man die for the sake of that message as far as we know. And they would die in separate places on their own because of their conviction that Jesus died and was raised in accordance with the scriptures because he is the Lord and Christ. He is the Savior. And that cut them to their hearts. And if that cuts you to your heart and you want to know what to do, brothers, what shall we do? Repent. 
Repent tonight. Call on the name of Jesus as Lord and Christ as Savior tonight, right now. All of your sins will be forgiven. Because salvation is all forgiveness. But that's not all. Because forgiveness is not all of salvation. You know, it's, it's one of those basic principles of quadrilaterals that uh, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not always a square. Or maybe say it a different way, that, that a, a house is a building, but a building is not always a house. Well, salvation always includes forgiveness, but forgiveness and salvation are not necessarily the same thing because salvation includes much more than forgiveness. And we see that in this passage tonight. We see that, that forgiveness is not all of salvation. Notice what the last part of verse 38, 38 says. There's the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And notice that promise is not just for the apostles. It's not just for those who had gathered together and who had the, the flames like a fire upon their heads. No, it's everyone who believes in Jesus receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, we just, we just finished a series on the gift or the, on the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who dwells within a Christian. And the Holy Spirit is the one who produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control in the lives of a believer. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. The Holy Spirit is the helper. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And the Holy Spirit makes us family. We, we heard that in our call to worship today. We hear it in Romans chapter 8. You have, not, you, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ Jesus. And the Spirit convicts. The Spirit equips. The Spirit instructs and gives direction in the Christian's life. Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1 for the Christians in Ephesus that, that the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Christ would come to them and that they would know the immeasurable greatness of of his power at work in them. What sort of power at work in them through the Holy Spirit? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit is resurrection power. Last week, <clears throat> last week we saw that in the book of Acts, as much as this is the acts of the apostles and as much as this is the acts of the Holy Spirit, this is the acts of Jesus Christ. And Jesus continues his ministry in the book of Acts. And what we find him doing in Acts chapter 2 is the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, by the way, we also considered last week how Jesus' message of forgiveness to his tormentors prompts our own forgiveness of those who have done harm against us. Well, think about everything in this passage along those same lines that contribute to the work of our forgiving others in our own lives. There's the providence of God. Peter says that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, and you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It's both. God did it and they did it. It's God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. God is working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And you remember the story of Joseph, don't you? 
and how Joseph was able to forgive his brothers for selling him into slavery. How was he able to do that? It's because of what he says at the end of the book of Genesis. That as, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You see, God's providence helps us to put the, the actions of others in the bigger picture within the framework of the plan of God, and it helps us to wait patiently, to wait expectantly for how God will use even those harms for our good and for his glory. And then there's, in this passage, the day of the Lord. And the perspective that we get in Peter's sermon is that the coming of Jesus in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension is the coming of the day of the Lord. Why? Because he is the Lord. And then at Jesus' return, he will bring about the completion of all that the day of the Lord entails. Judgment, mercy, blessing, new heavens and new earth. No more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. Perfect fellowship with God and with one another forever. Why do we have that hope? Why is that guaranteed to us tonight? And we can live on that fact tonight because Jesus reigns. And he will make all things right. He will establish justice once and for all. And so we can, we can bear burdens. We can absorb debts. We can forgive wrongs because one day God's people will be vindicated as righteous in Christ Jesus. Then the Holy Spirit. We find in Acts chapter 2. What do we do when we find ourselves at odds with others and needing to be reconciled? What's the ministry of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. The Holy Spirit is the one who softens and changes hearts. The, the Holy Spirit is the one who ministers reconciliation. We can't change other people's hearts. We can't even change our own hearts, but the Holy Spirit can. And you see, salvation is bigger than just forgiveness. And we need to remember that in our own relationships when we find ourselves in conflict. That there's a bigger plan at work. And there's the perspective of eternity at work. And there's the Holy Spirit at work. And the Spirit is the Spirit of love. He's the Spirit of unity and of fellowship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. When Peter finished his sermon, it says in verse 41, those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, koinonia, and to the breaking of bread and prayers. I told you a few weeks ago about my friend who, who died recently. And there was a gathering for his friends at the sober living house where he had lived for a year and a half. You know, I, as I was there, I was really struck. I was struck by how readily and willingly and openly people would speak without hesitation. They would express their emotions. They would open up immediately. And I couldn't help but wonder to myself if, if that had been in the church in a group of 50 or more people, how many of us would have been willing to speak up and to open up so willingly, so readily, so candidly? I don't know. I'm not sure what that would have looked like. Because so often we can come here with our guards up, can't we? And we can come here wanting to have our lives all cleaned up for public viewing. And I find that I'm haunted by A.W. Tozer's quote when he says that the Spirit could be removed, the Holy Spirit could be removed from the church and 90 to 95 percent of what we do would carry on as usual. Surely that's an exaggeration for effect, I hope. 
but we're all just a bunch of repentant sinners. I know it. You know it. We're not fooling anybody. And we're saved not because we're nice, not because we're respectable or devout. We're saved by God's grace and by God's grace alone. We're saved because Jesus did it all for us in his death and his resurrection. And that sets us free. That sets us free before God and before one another to come together in this remarkable fellowship, this remarkable koinonia. And whatever we might say about these days in the early church and about the signs and the wonders and the selling of their possessions and having all things in common, what we can say is that when they repented and when they believed in Jesus and when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they shared their lives together. They were joyful and they were generous. They praised God. They had favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Did you catch that? Did you hear who did it? It was the Lord. It was Jesus who did it. It was Jesus who was at work among them, bringing more and more people to salvation. You know, I've, I've actually been very encouraged lately, and several people have even commented on this, about how on our Sunday nights after worship, people don't leave, and you stick around to be with each other, and to talk, and to listen, and to laugh, and sometimes even to pray, and it's really remarkable I don't know what to make of it, but Jesus does it. And my encouragement to us would be, let's lean into that. Let's do more of that and see where Jesus takes us in that sort of thing. What might happen? What might happen here if we let the Holy Spirit work with resurrection power? What would happen if we start to share our lives with one another and to meet each other's needs, not because it, it's part of our job description or a part of our committee assignment, but because we are brought together with this incredible fellowship, this koinonia. And then as we praise God together, what might the Lord do? What might Jesus do among us? Does it make you a little nervous? It should. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us, shape us, mold us, make us into the image of Christ. Make us into this sort of fellowship, this koinonia this deep bond of love and unity and sharing and generosity of praise to you. We ask that you would do it not because we are worthy, not because we deserve it, not because we have all things right, but because it is what Jesus does and what Jesus has accomplished for us. We pray that you would do it not to make our name great, but to make Jesus' name great and to bring the loss to salvation, that we would reach out into our neighborhood and into our communities and even around the world with the good news of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.